Don't be thinking I'm going to preach as well. <laughs> Might be one day. <laughs> Before we worship the Lord with songs and hymns, I just want to read uh, Psalm 1. And the heading in my Bible is true happiness. <clears throat> Happy are those who reject the advice of evil men, who do not follow the example of sinners, or join those who have no use for God. Instead, they find joy in obeying the law of the Lord. And they study it day and night. They are like trees that grow beside a stream, that bear fruit at the right time, and whose leaves do not dry up. They succeed in everything they do, but evil men are like, <clears throat> not like this at all. They are like straw that the wind blows away. Sinners will be condemned by God and kept apart from God's own people. The righteous are guided and protected by the Lord, but evil are on the way to their doom. May God bless his word to our hearts and minds. Psalm 1. This psalm presents two ways of life, the way of the righteous and the way of the wicked. However, the key subject is the centrality of God's word to the life and fruitfulness of the righteous who truly love his word. Two great truths flow out of this. A. The importance and absolute necessity of the scripture and B. The change character, stability and fruitfulness it promises to those who make scripture the core of their lives. Verse 2 and 3 hold simple wisdom. The more we delight in obeying God, the more fruitful we are. On the other hand, the more we allow those who ridicule God to affect our thoughts and attitude, the more we separate ourselves from the source of nourishment. We must have contact with unbelievers if we are witness to them, but we must not join in or imitate their sinful behavior. Large trees represent power, majesty, and stability. Have you ever noticed the difference between a tree planted by the water and a tree far away from the water? The tree next to the water is much more healthy and vibrant. Its fruit and blossom are more fruitful. In Jeremiah 17, 13 says, fountain or living water. In the scripture, the word of God is compared to water. When you are planted in the word of God, your spirit is fed and you grow strong, just like the tree planted by the water. Trees planted by the water will yield fruit at the right season and will not lose strength. These verses tell us that those who love and obey the Lord will prosper in whatever they do. The phrase, they prosper in, in all they do, does not mean immunity to failure or difficulties, nor does it guarantee health, wealth, and happiness. What the Bible means by prosperity is this, when we apply God's wisdom, the fruit we bear will be good and receive God's approval. Just as a tree soaks of water and bears luscious fruit, we also are to soak of God's word, producing action and attitude that honor God. To achieve anything worthwhile, we must have God's word in our hearts. Thank you for listening. Now we're going to worship the Lord with the hymn, The Lord is My Shepherd.
that we trust in the Lord. We are not afraid of this COVID-19. We are protected by the Lord. But please keep following the government guidelines. <laughs> That's important as well. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes and talk to God. Dear Lord, we thank you for being able to come into your presence this morning to worship you, to praise you, and glorify your name. In, in spite of these difficult circumstances, we thank you that we are still be able to come to you, to give thanks to you, to learn more about you. This is the best investment we can ever make, to spend time in your presence. This is the place where we can learn more about you, to have a deeper relationship with you, to grow spiritually, and to have fellowship with others. Lord, how majestic is your name and all the earth. When we see the work of your hands, the earth, the heavens, and the moon, the stars, and the beauty of your creation, we praise and worship you alone. Almighty God, we thank you for all your creation and your people throughout the world and all their different cultures and environments. Lord, we thank you for all the staff who keep this church running smoothly. Lord, guide everyone to serve you faithfully with all their hearts and minds and strength. And help them all to follow the government guidelines so we, they can protect us as we come to church every week. Lord, we thank you for your guidance, protection and provision during the last week. May you use us to reach out to others through our words and actions to share the good news. Lord, we pray for Sunday school teachers as they are a very special group of people. They regularly sacrifice their time, money and resources to offer spiritual training to our children, help the students to be attentive and the teachers to be patient. May the lessons that are taught how to instill righteousness in these children and may the seeds planted here continue to guide them throughout their lives. Lord, help our children and youth to honor and obey their parents and guardians so that things may go well with them here on earth and everlasting life in the kingdom of heaven. <clears throat> Lord, we also pray for our technical team who help us to worship you, Lord Jesus. Without them, we will not be able to complete our worship. Through worship, our hearts and minds are tuned into your holy word to worship you in truth and spirit. Lord, we pray for spiritual growth of our church so we can draw closer to you and each other. In Jesus' name we ask, Amen. Please join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, I lift my eyes to the quiet hill.
of service for offering. Whereas we have not been collecting the offering, we have not been not, we now been praying for the offering. So this morning I felt we should pray for offering even we put in the offering in the books after this service. So shall we pray? Dear loving Father, we thank you for your many blessings upon us. We believe what we are and what we have is a gift from you. We bring these gifts and offerings as a token of our love for you. Bless these gifts and the givers and use them for your furtherance of your kingdom in heaven and on earth. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Now I'm going to pray once again. We need to pray for Bert and Olive and uh, Dorian. Dorian has moved to, I suppose, near Chorley somewhere, and uh, Bert, uh, they still need accommodation for Bert, I think. <coughs> He's still in hospital. So let's pray. Gracious, loving, and merciful God, we have come together in the name of Christ to offer our praise and thanksgiving, to hear and receive your holy word, to pray for the needs of the world, and to seek the forgiveness of our sins. Jesus, help us to offer ourselves to the service of God. Lord, let the light of your word penetrate our hearts and minds so we can have a deeper understanding and a loving relationship with you. We offer to you this day all the facts of our lives, whether it be at home, at work, or at school, to be humble, patient, kind, and loving to others. Lord, we pray for those in need. We pray for especially Merton Olive and Dorin, that you help her to settle into her new home and find accommodation for birth and olive. For all sick people, for those in hospital, and for those with any other problems, Lord, comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Give them courage and hope in their troubles, and bless them who care for them. And especially we pray for the NHS as they look after the patient during this pandemic that you give them the strength and wisdom to do the best way so they are not get infected. Lord, we ask for your blessing upon our brother Eric as he brings your word to us and give us wisdom to understand your holy word. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Now I think uh, we're ready. Les?
the Word of God. No. We thank you, Brother Eric. Is 
staggered at the request that Moses said, show me your glory. He'd been with God in the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. He'd seen that awesome sight and he even trembled at it. But did Moses feel that there was more to the glory of God than the thunderings and the lightnings and the sound of trumpets, the fire, the darkness, the cloud that overshadowed the mountain? What Moses was observing was God's awesome and fearful holiness. The Bible tells us that, that God lives in light which no man can approach unto. He was so near to the immediate presence of God that no, that no man could have looked on him and lived. And even for Moses to see God's face meant he would have been consumed by the sight of it. What an awesome thing it was that took place in that dry, dusty, hot, arid wilderness. So then how did God show Moses his glory, even though he did not see the face of God? Well, the answer is very simple. Moses didn't see the face of God. God hid Moses in the cleft of the rock, and as he passed by him, uh, Moses saw his angelic retinue, just the back as Moses passed by, and it must have been a fearful sight just to see as what describes as the back parts of God. But, but how did God show Moses his glory? That is the question. Well, he showed him his glory by his word as he passed by him. And as he passed by Moses in the rock, God spoke words to him. And this is what he said. The God of compassion and mercy, I am slow to anger and full of unfailing love and faithfulness. I lavish unfailing love to a thousand generations. I forgive iniquity and sin, but I do not excuse the guilty. And then we read that Moses threw himself to the ground and worshipped. He had seen now the very nature and the glory of God. Behind the awesome power of his, of his superb holiness, above all that, his real character was his love and his mercy. What an amazing thing was that. Moses fell on his face and worshipped. And yet he'd seen all this noise, the thunderings and lightnings, but it was those words of God, a God who is full of compassion, full of forgiveness, full of faithful love, that caused him to fall on his face and worship him. Now, God's love, of course, does not exclude his justice. But you know, we also see the glory of God manifested in creation. Uh, when Isaiah had that vision in the temple, God said, oh, the, aim, the cherubim said, the whole earth is full of his glory. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament show of his happy works. So creation itself reveals to us something of the magnificent glory of God. You know, sad it, sad it is. I once was talking to someone and they said, oh, well, I can worship God in the countryside. I don't need to go to church to worship God. I can worship God in the country. I can look at nature. And that's true, of course. You can worship God in the countryside. You can worship God anywhere if you're a Christian. But you see, people say they're worshipping God, but what they're worshipping is not God, the Creator, but they're worshipping creation. This was the trouble with the ancient Egyptians. They worshipped the sun and the moon. And even people like David Attenborough, who produced such wonderful nature films, that they have this, uh, they're taken up with the wonders of creation. And it's right, of course, that they should be. But they're not taken up with the wonder of God who made all these things. We can worship the creature and creation and forget God altogether. The glory of God is the only thing that should matter to us as Christians who are made in the image and likeness 
in that first chapter of John, he says, We beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Notice the glory that John refers to here. It's a glory of Jesus who was full of grace and truth. That was the glory that God revealed to Moses on Mount Sinai. A God of forgiveness, a God of love, a God of, of infinite compassion. You see, that, that, that glory on Sinai terrifies us. But the glory and the grace that we see in Jesus gives us wonderful peace. And you know, the glory of God does not shine any brighter in Jesus than when he was dying on the cross. When Jesus died on the cross, we see the glory of God. That's an amazing thing. When we look at the suffering Saviour dying there in dereliction, being hated, despised, held up to ridicule, abused beyond the description, abused bodily, abused spiritually. We marvel at the cross, but the cross shows us more of the glory of God, I believe, than anything else. Because in the cross, we see that the, the fulfilment of the words that God spoke to Moses, a God of compassion, of love, of, a God of forgiveness. And in the cross we see the full extent of the love of God. We see his compassion and his forgiving nature to those who had driven those nails into his hands. And even in his most uh, painful moments on the cross, his words to their Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. Surely, dear friends, this morning, this is the real glory and the character of God. You know, every sinner who comes to know and to love Jesus is evidence of the love and the grace of God. The Apostle Paul said, The Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And so, dear friends, this morning, if the earth is so beautiful, and glorious in every part, then what will it be like to look upon the face of Jesus, who made it all? Surely the person who made it all, to see his glory, is greater even than the creation that, that, he, that he's put in place. To know and to love the person who created all things in heaven and earth is superior to what he has created. There is a hymn that says, My goal is God Himself. That's our goal, is God Himself. The greatest thing that you and I could ever hope for is the glory of God. That's the greatest thing. Paul says that as Christians, we live in the hope of the glory of God. And Paul says, Christ within you, the hope of glory. This is what we are living for. This is where our hope is, to see the glory of God. What a blessed thing it is to know Jesus. What a blessed thing it is to know his forgiving love. And you know, the glory of God is the true riches. His glory is the only thing that will satisfy us for eternity. Nothing else can. The glory of God is the eternal prize that God gives to those who love and serve Him. And so our desire, each one of us here this morning, our first desire and foremost should be that God will be glorified in us. God wants to glorify Himself through His people. True happiness is only realized when our lives are glorifying God. And the Apostle Paul again says to the Corinthians, whatever you do, let it all be to the glory of God. We are here on earth to glorify God. And even Jesus said, even a cup of water given in my name will not lose its reward. Our lives are here to glorify God. 
God, Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. So how can we glorify God? How can we glorify God in our lives? Well, first of all, by confessing and proclaiming him. That is Jesus. Do you ever talk about Jesus to your friends? Do you proclaim him? You may not necessarily be a preacher, you may not be able to stand in a pulpit and do what I'm doing now, but the fact is we can all confess him and proclaim him. And the other way that we glorify God is by serving him. In the most menial things we can serve God. We don't have to do great exploits to serve God. We can serve God in the mundane and the trivial things of life, like the hymn said, the trivial round of common tasks will serve us all we ought to ask. We can glorify Him by giving our lives in faithful service to Him. We can glorify Him by obeying obey Him. Jesus said, if you love me, if you say that you love me, then keep my commandments. And the Bible says that God's commandments are not grievous to us. They don't cause grief when we, when we keep His commandments. We can glorify Him by worshipping Him and adoring Him. As we are do here to do, do this morning, to worship and to glorify God. We can glorify Him by putting our hope in Him. Well, what's your hope in this life? Is it to win, is it to win the lottery? Or is it your hope is that you are going to stand one day in the presence of God? I hope this morning that is your main hope. Because it's certainly mine. I have no other hope but that. My hope is in Jesus Christ. And we can glorify him as well by coming away from the false standards of the world and living as children of God's heavenly kingdom. Everything in this world is transient and cannot last, but nothing is transient in the life which is to come. The Bible says that he who does the will of God abides forever, even as the Son abides forever. And of course, the glory of God also brings with it fullness of joy. David saw this right back in the, in the Old Testament. He said, in thy presence there is fullness of joy, and at thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. And also Jesus is preparing a place for us. Let me tell you something that happened to me a few years ago. I went to, up to a conference with my, um, with my company and they put us up in one of the poshest hotels uh, on the island of uh, New York at the Valparaiso Palace. And uh, it was an amazing place. And I remember getting the key from my bedroom and uh, opened the door. And uh, what a suite of rooms. I had a four poster bed overlooking the sea, bathrooms, and other rooms. It was an amazing place. It must have cost a fortune. I could never have afforded it to stay in an hotel like that. But every single room in that hotel had a view of the sea. It was magnificent, magnificent. The only trouble with my wife wasn't with me. That was the shame. Uh, it was such a wonderful place to put in a hotel that you would never have stayed at uh, if you were paying for it yourself, I guess. But uh, the thing was, every room had a view. And Jesus said, In my Father's house are many rooms, are many mansions. He said, And I am going there to prepare a place for you, that where I am, there you and the wonderful thing about the mansions of Jesus is that every room has a view. And that view is a view of the glory of God. Hallelujah. What an expectation we should have, which goes beyond everything that's happening in our world today, that goes beyond this life. 
So how can we this morning apply these things to our own lives here and now? Well, if we have the glory of God as our objective in life, then nothing should move us. And I say nothing, nothing. Thank you, Jim. The world is not our home. We are strangers and pilgrims in it. We are just a passing through, as the Negro spiritual says. And so we should realize, with all that's happening with COVID and all that's happening around us and the distress that we see, and there is great distress in our nation, in our world today, through all the things that's happening. It's affected so much. And of course we feel that we are human like, like anyone else. But the fact is, dear friends, this world is not our home. We are strangers and pilgrims. And we should also realise this morning that nothing that happens to us can separate us from the love of Christ. If God is for us, then who can be against us? We should always live our lives with eternity in view. Is that how you live your life? Are you looking forward to being with Christ? None of us want to die, of course not, but there is that aspect, to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. We should always live our lives with eternity in view, and not set our hopes and our aspirations on things that are on this earth. We should love God and by His grace keep His commandments. For in Psalm 119 it tells us that in keeping them there is great reward. And so we should learn as Christians to look beyond the circumstances of this life, whatever they may be, and to look to Jesus. The Bible tells us in Hebrews to look in unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. And of course we should not grow weary in well-doing, particularly to our brothers and sisters in Christ, in our church family. We should not weary of doing good things. Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. It's part of our living for the glory of God. So let us glorify God now by how we live, how we, how we help others, and particularly those of our church family. See, those people who make light of the things that I'm saying this morning are in certain danger of losing their souls by not listening and heeding these divine things. These are the most glorious things that we could ever know, is to have this hope of the glory of God. If we have everything that this world can offer us but do not have Christ, then we have nothing but dust and ashes. So where are your hopes, where are your aspirations this morning? As the Bible reminds us constantly, we bring nothing into this world and we certainly take nothing out of it. We take ourselves out of it and we take out of it the fact whether we've entered into a living relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ. We may not have earthly riches, but if we have Jesus, we possess all things. Paul says as having nothing yet possessing all things. Paul says, I count the things of this world, but refuse that I may gain Christ. Christ was precious to, to Paul. And so, it says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto us. It says in the Bible, in the New Testament, God has entered into a new covenant with his people. He says, we are not come now to a mountain that burns with terrifying fire, with the sound of trumpets, with that awesome presence of God that is unapproachable. But we have come to the new Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the spirits of just men made perfect. Under this new covenant, we are able to enter into the very presence of God. You know, the wonderful 
wonderful thing about Jesus coming into the world is this. You see, when we think of the, the vastness of the wisdom, the knowledge, and the breadth, and the scope of God, you see that he knows every planet, he knows every bird, he knows everything about us, the vastness of his knowledge and wisdom. How can we understand a being like that? who is so much above us and who lives in holiness that no man can approach unto. But Jesus came down. This same God in, in Christ was all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So that although we, we will be consumed by looking upon God in his essential glory as it were, we can see the glory of God in Jesus. But Paul says, God who commanded the light to shine out of the darkness has shined into our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That's where the glory of God is, in the face of Jesus Christ. And we're going to see him. We're going to see him one day. And the promises in Revelation to the church, and in one of them it says to him that overcometh, I will grant that he will sit down with me in my throne as I am sat down in my father's throne. Think about that. Not only just about seeing the glory of God in the face of Jesus, but sitting down with him in his throne. It is stupendous. That's far different to what the glory of what Moses experienced on Mount Sinai. It was only when God spoke to Moses, gave him that word, a God of compassion, of love and forgiveness, that we enter into the true glory of God. And you too this morning, if you don't already know it, can know that compassion and love of Jesus who came into this world to save sinners. Well, may God bless you all this morning. May God bless his word to our hearts. And let us remember to seek first of all the kingdom and the glory of God. Not to love the things of this world, but to love God and serve him faithfully. Amen. Our next hymn is uh, To God Be the Glory.
May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. A very polite announcement to make. Please follow the government guidelines uh, regarding uh, COVID-19 as you come in wear masks and use hand sanitizer and do not gather after church in the uh, after service in the church or out in the car park. You can talk to people as long as you keep your distance, three meters distance. And we church prefer not to uh, people gather outside in the car park. Thank you.